Hi, this is Katie Bergloff, and I'm recording this for my blog, Living with Embouchure Dystonia. I'm making a second video over beginning rehabilitation strategies. Um, I thought it would help to show what I kind of do and demonstrate uh, the things that help me, even though I've written su substantially uh, over all my uh, documentation and rehabilitation for the last uh, nine years on my blog. Um, I felt like uh, adding more videos demonstrating what I did would help. Um, so the first video I'll link in here in the comment section for you to click on if you're interested in watching. And the second video I'm going into more detail um, about what I did when I moved to the horn. But before I get to that, I want to kind of recap about just the mouthpiece buzzing because there's there is a couple things I missed. And there are a couple items that I forgot to show you. So I know in the first video I kind of showed you the Pete uh, embouchure trainer, which um, will help between during the times when you can't necessarily play. And then I also do use the Power Lung, which is a breathing device uh, that you can buy online. Um, it's mainly used for athletes, but as musicians, we sometimes our professors will require us to buy uh, breathing devices. And mine never did, but I, I actually bought this uh, once I started rehabilitating because I thought it would really help me a lot. Um, now, uh, talking about the mouthpiece buzzing. Uh, so there's something that I forgot to mention. and um, I wanted to talk about how uh, I also keep a spare mouthpiece in my car. You can also attach one to your keychain if there's one that you kind of don't like. <laughs> you know, that's either plastic or something that, you know, you feel like you can drill a hole in. Um, and then uh, I also made sure that when I was buzzing that I would practice stretching and uh, changing the back pressure on the mouthpiece. So when buzzing, you can change the back pressure by either adding your pinky to the back of the bore by either uh, doing a fourth if you can, or just experiment with half waist covering it or whatever. Because sometimes when you have an amateur dystonia, the different back pressures help a lot and it eases your way into into fully buzzing again. Because uh, again, when you have amateur dystonia, you are having all these tremors, and sometimes it's so bad that it carries over to pre-buzzing and buzzing, and sometimes even when you're just talking. So uh, here's an example. <laughs> I can add a little bit of back pressure by adding my pinky. I can add even more. And this kind of adds a little bit of resistance. Um, and the more resistance actually helps me. Um, I don't know why it causes me to stay, my embouchure to stabilize. And this kind of carries over into uh, Lucinda Lewis's block buzzing. Um, now, if you uh, don't own Lucinda Lewis's book, uh, she wrote a book called uh, Broken Embouchures. Um, and it's about the different types of setbacks that you deal with with the embouchure. And one of her technique methods in recovery was block buzzing. Now, that's where you fully cover the end and no sound comes out. The reason she did this was because she found out one time by blowing it into a soda bottle that when the no air escaped, it forced her embouchure muscles to um, rely on that back pressure to form a natural embouchure. And it reminded her of, it reminded her body of that embouchure setting. It reminded her body of what her normal embouchure should, um, setting is and what it should look like. So, um, it's like kind of like, uh, how do I say it? Uh, it causes your embouchure to set naturally, um, but I don't know how to explain it further. Okay, so covering the whole thing, and then you can practice, uh, even though no air is coming out, practice buzzing up and down, and I usually try doing this, but especially using um, a little, like not as much pressure, meaning not as much air, I guess I should say. So going ahead and do that. I'll go ahead and try and show you what my ombre looks like. Okay, and I know it seems like it wouldn't make sense, but it really does um, over time help a lot practicing this way with the block buzzing. 
And she has um, exercises in her book that are awesome. And um, you can try those too and see if they help you as well. Um, and even if you don't have embouchure dystonia, they may help you if you have an injury other than embouchure dystonia. Um, or if you're just having struggles with, uh, with your embouchure in general. Okay. So, um, stretching while buzzing. How do I do this? So I notice when, uh, in the beginning stages, when I go to play, uh, sometimes my, I have so much tension in my face. And this tension, um, you can feel the tension um you you will feel the need to either tense up through either extreme puckering or extreme like a smile like a smile embouchure it, or it could be a collapse too but you feel like your muscles are forcing you to tense up in in either three of these ways so when i let's say for example i feel that when i go to blow or buzz into my mouthpiece um I feel like my embouchure wants to really tense up in the form of a pucker. So I'm going to go ahead and buzz and I'm going to uh, work my way into extreme pucker. And in a sense, this is a stretch because I'm fully tensing up into that stretch and holding it and then releasing. Oh. So see how I tensed up all the way? Just like stretching your muscles, you're going to stretch and tense them up as much as you can and then release them. So I released it. And when I did this, I found that I released a lot of that tension, that feeling of wanting to overly pucker or overly tense up in the embouchure or overly smile or overly collapse. So, um, and then if, if that didn't help, I would practice all three. So, for example, let's say I feel like um, I keep feeling that intense intensity to want to fully pucker, but I I, I decide to do a full stretch also. So I'm going to do a full stretch. Uh, or full smile, sorry. Uh, uh, And then a collapse, and this one's hard to do. And so I'm gonna hold those out until it feels a little better. And then once I release that tension, I'm gonna go back and just buzz like I normally do. I'm not even gonna think about it. I'm not gonna try to tense up or or um, go into the stretching and tr see how it feels. And uh, usually I would find that would help, help, and I would feel a lot less tense. Even if it was like just a little bit of less tension, I would feel definitely less grip um, I, I would feel like the dystonia would have less grip over uh, over my face. I would feel that less of that tension that was setting in, less of that tension that was created by the dystonia. Um, so stretching with the mouthpiece while buzzing, um, that was, is really important to me. And like I said, I also do, before I even play, I do facial stretches, and I do neck stretches, tongue stretches, jaw stretches, upper back stretches. Um and in the beginning, it was so bad. It's like I had to do all of this prep work before I even played. Where now, I don't have to do as much prep work. I don't have to do as many stretches before I go into playing. Um, but I still do them, even if it's just like five minutes of stretching. But in the beginning, it was like I would just literally, almost my whole entire re rehabilitation was stretching and buzzing uh, for months on end. And um, that was all it was. It, there was no playing, really. Um, so moving on, um, when I talk about the, the production of sound on the horn, in the last video I kind of talked about how uh, I moved from how I moved from buzzing into playing the horn. For some people, that causes too much tension, so you don't have to do that way if it doesn't help you. And again, I'm just doing these videos to show you what worked for me. It might not work for you, but I hope you can take away at least a couple things that might be able to help you or lessen the tension or 
help you at least establish a sound if you can't get one out. Um, but if the buzzing plane doesn't work, one of the things I felt that helped reestablish the sound was uh, air puffs. So just being able, feeling your almost your upper and lower lip and your or your cheeks sometimes with air and blowing out air that way into your mouthpiece rather than uh, a normal standard embouchure where you you use your tongue instead. It's almost like a puff. I call it an air puff. Um, so uh, a couple of other things that helped me when I started playing the horn again, meaning I uh, started rehabilitating while playing my horn uh, after I established the sound, was, uh, again, lo using loose, uh, gentle air, uh, no playing loud. I didn't use a metronome. I definitely avoided playing loud. I didn't do long tones at all. Um, and you can do, I mean, you can do long tones. Uh, sometimes that helps. It really helps the, the hold notes out really gently. Just practice trying to do that on certain notes and holding the notes out and um, uh, with loose air and just kind of working on that gentle plane. But when I talk about long tones, I don't mean just practicing holding notes out. I'm talking about long tones with the where you it as I'm talking about the technique where you start off soft and then you gradually get louder and then you get you day crescendo and get softer and this is because this is so taxing on the muscles. It's not. Um, you're not only practicing breath control with long tones, but you're practicing like this kind of um, uh, moving from soft to loud that requires a lot of not only muscle endurance and air, air support, um, but it also creates a lot of tension too, I feel. So I avoided those altogether because in, you know, in even some of the notes you, you can't even hold out. So um, it never helped. It ne at least never helped with me, the long tones. I can do them now, but I could not do them in the past at all. Um, no decrescendo is a crescendo dynamic practice. Again, the same thing with the long tones. Um, I didn't tongue or articulate in my plane. I used air puffs at first, and I still kind of interchange now between that. I'll, I'll use air puffs and tonguing. I'll interchange because there's still certain passages that I'll play where I can tell, like, let's say I'm going, uh, I'm descending in a passage, I might be like, oh my gosh, I can't tongue all these notes in a row, so I'm going to, it's kind of like the slower two tongue two method, except where it's like air puff one, tongue another, air puff another, and then tongue another kind of thing. Um, I always focus on the air guide and the embouchure and, uh, technique still uh, needs to continue always, and I can't emphasize that importance, uh, especially for me. Um, and then I also stretch while playing. The same thing I showed you with the buzzing in the mouthpiece, I do when I'm playing horn. So I might uh, go to play, let me grab my horn here. I might play my middle C. And again, let's say I'm playing my middle C and I find that I, my embouchure really wants to pucker. So I'll go into that extreme pucker and stretch that out of there, get that tension out of there by stretching it. I'll relax and then a stretch which is a little harder to do for me or not the stretch the smile I keep calling it stretch smile stretch and again, these do not sound pretty, but I'm again, it's not about the sound, it's about the stretching. And then the collapse. I'll do this on a pedal note because it's easier. So um, I'll sometimes stretch when I'm playing, and sometimes I'll be even playing a passage or something. And um, I'll stop after I get done playing. You'll see me like covering my face in some of my videos and uh, doing stretches uh, when I can, just to get that tension out of there. Um, so uh, stretching while you're playing can help too. And then there's the normal stretches outside of the mouthpiece. If you feel that's too difficult to do while you're playing, then don't do it. I, I definitely could, didn't. I definitely actually didn't start doing stretches while playing until maybe last year. Um, so I, I've come pretty far and now I've started integrating them in my plane. Um, uh, another thing that helped when I started playing my horn and, uh, working on regaining, uh, notes, and I talked about in the last video about how you can regain notes by, um, 
working on air bending from a stable note into an unstable note. Um, and so I do this by isolating specific groups of notes or isolating specific registers. Uh, for example, I start off in the low register and I never really cross registers yet or start in the high register because it's too much tension. But I find a stable pitch and work my way into an unstable note directly below it through air bending. Um, I call this anchoring. Um, I know that people will just say, oh, it's just air bending or bending a pitch, but I call it anchoring because you're trying to anchor onto another, you're trying to anchor from another note and regain control of another note. I know, but anyways, that's my terminology. Um, so let's go ahead and do, I'm going to try and do my middle C again, and I'm going to try and go down to my B. And it's okay if it's shaky. It's really difficult to air bend when you have embouchure dissonance. So um, you want to find a really stable note, like your most stable note to start on, um, to do that on, and to uh, work your way uh, regaining pitches going downwards first. Um, and then if that's too difficult, then just disregard that altogether. Again, um, some of these things might be too difficult, but again, these types of uh, things I worked on developed over time, over a really long time. So I don't want you to think that I just did all of this all at once. Like the air bending and the um, the working on the uh, the stretches and all the stuff. These are things that I figured out in in time as I rehabilitated to figure out what helped me and what worked. And um, it definitely wasn't I wasn't able to just play my horn right away. I wasn't able to produce a sound right away. And it took me a long time just to reestablish the sound. And then not only that, but to find figure out like what notes I could that were stable and what notes were really weak and to figure out that, you know, I could, I had to really learn how my dysfunctional embouchure functioned and by playing my horn and just kind of observing and taking notes of what I could or couldn't do. Now, um, before I, I talk about the, what I did to help, uh, in my horn playing more, I want to take a moment to talk about how, um, sometimes people get a little bit, I think, confused when they, uh, watch my videos or read my blog about how I re rehabilitate. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, I can't focus on the physical aspects of, of the plane. Like I can't, I, I was taught that, you know, I rehabilitated, uh, with someone else and I was shown to not focus on the amateur or not focus on, on, um, uh, being aware of all of this or anything like that. Um, but then again, uh, a lot of the people that have messaged me in this way have not recovered nearly as much as I have. And I'm not saying that their method is wrong or that it won't work. And I don't want you to think that I'm disregarding it. But I, I'm, I think it's important to show other ways of rehabilitating. I mean, and I'm only showing what has worked for me um, and doesn't always work for other people. But the main thing is I don't want things to be um, misleading or confusing so uh, when I do focus on these physical aspects, I don't want people to think that like, oh, I'm doing this in like a very kind of um, rigid kind of uh, routine specific way. Like it's not like I'm going and practicing Koprash every day or running through A2s every day or focusing on Farkas' embouchure setup or anything like that. But I'm literally, all I'm doing is I'm being aware of what, signals are being sent to my body. I'm being aware of how my dysfunctional embouchure functions by just being aware of what it's doing. Oh, I can't play the C. Well, how can I regain control of it? Oh, I just happened to find that when I was playing the D above it and I bent the note down into the C, I was able to regain more control over that note. Or, oh, I found by buzzing and then buzzing, buzzing into the mouthpiece and then buzzing into the mouthpiece and the horn, I was able to regain control of that note. So it's all a lot of really experimentation and kind of uh, give and take. And um, you have to find out what works best for you because only your body can tell you what works best for you. And you know your body better than anyone else. So if not focusing on any of this helps, uh, then go ahead and do that. That's what works for you. But um, 
for me, it, I definitely have to be aware. I'm definitely the type of person that documents what happens for the sake of not only um, understanding my body better, but also for the sake of just documenting my progress in general, because uh, there are no other brass players that I know of out there that are documenting their rehabilitation like this uh, through uh, consistent videos and writing a blog and sharing what works for them or what doesn't work for them. Um, I've never, I, I haven't heard of anybody else that does that. So because this is rare, rarely documented and, and I'm going on on a limb and documenting it, a very personal process, um, I want to be very thorough and as thorough as I can and, and be as clear as I can about what I'm doing. So, um, for example, uh, this air bending thing, uh, maybe it doesn't help you, but it's worth a try if, if you got nothing left to lose. You know, when I had, when I first was diagnosed, it's like I would try anything to get my sound back. I would try anything to just try and make progress. So, if you feel like it, it's worth a try and it might help you, then, um, you know, you can go ahead and try it. But if you feel like for some reason it's dangerous or not safe for you to do, then you don't have to do it. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, another thing that helped me uh, regain some of my playing was working on a cluster of notes. So, for example, I could I felt like I could play from my, my middle C down to my A flat, uh, slurred chromatically. And um, this was like the only thing I felt I definitely could do at first. Like, oh, when I play my horn, this is the only thing I can do um, that felt stable. So I started to slow it down a little. So this little five note cluster, um, I used as a way to kind of, um, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, add on other notes or regain control of other notes or add more notes onto the cluster. So like I felt safe going from my C down to my A flat, but as soon as I had to go down to the G, the A flat to the G was really shaky. Like my low G used to be so unstable, I couldn't even, um, I could barely grab onto it. So I would try to use this chromatic slur as a way of breaking into it because I couldn't air bend into it that for some reason that didn't work. So I had to use this five note cluster to regain some of my, some of my notes. <laughs> And what I would do is I go down that note and I briefly touch it and then go back up. And then I go back down and try and touch it a little longer or hold out the G a little bit longer and see if I could do it. as I as I regain my abilities over time and this little cluster also helped me warm up too like when I whenever I went to play my horn uh, in the beginning I would do this little cluster warm up and I still do a little bit but I mainly use it in the pedal register now um, which I did before but I also did in the middle register a lot uh, but sometimes I'll do it on my pedal register um, just because for some reason I feel like it helps with the blood circulation and it helps me um, it helps me test uh, what notes I have control of or not is just by chromatically slurring uh, up and down through each register, trying to fill things out and, and see if, if there's certain notes that I can't grasp. Because even when you're slurring, you can sometimes tell as you're flying by them which ones are unstable already. Because that's how sensitive your, your, um, that's how sensitive you are to the changes that, that are going on in your embouchure. Um, and again, it's such a weird thing to describe Estonia because, um, 
even though I'm super sensitive to certain changes like the back pressure on my mouthpiece to whether I can play with a mute or not. Um, and I'm sensitive to those changes, yet I feel lack of sensory or lack of touch when it comes to grasping notes or the feeling of grabbing a note. I feel like there's no sensory there. Like I can't feel feel the note or touch the note or uh, feel the surface of the note or grab it. Um, and so it's very confusing because it's like, how can I have be so sensitive to so many changes? Yeah, I can't even feel uh, the sensory that it takes to grab the note. It's just a, such an odd feeling. It's like your it's like your leg being asleep, and someone's hitting it with a, a reflex hammer, but then also somebody is lightly caressing it with a feather, and you can feel the feather. Your skin is sensitive to the touch of the feather, but your leg is asleep still, and you can't move it. And then there's this reflex hammer hitting your knee, and your leg is just spasming whenever it wants. Um, so I know that's a really weird analogy. I wrote about that before, but that's literally how I describe it, how I describe it, how it feels for me. Um, okay. Um, so this five note cluster and working my way into, uh, regaining other notes. Um, and I talked about how I use this to test and feel out my symptoms and weak areas also when I'm playing. Um, and then here is the really big, uh, part of what helped me in my rehabilitation the most when it came to playing my horn. And is it practicing opposite muscle movements? Um, and this kind of ties into three areas because it's not, it's kind of serves as a stretch. Like we're talking about stretching while playing and, um, practicing opposite muscle movements and also, um, adaptation because we're adapting and, um, making modifications to our playing to see if they help. Um, so there's 19 ways I can practice opposite movements, um, every day. In a way, this is like uh, stretching while playing, too. I don't know how to describe it. So first of all, like I talk about uh, playing with a fully stretched smile embouchure and then playing with a fully puckered embouchure. Again, it's very similar to the stretches. So playing my middle C. So I might, let's see, I'm going to try and play a scale, and I'm going to see if um, there's any areas of tension. So I definitely feel like I need to pucker for a second, so I'm going to go ahead and pucker. And practice this, this, uh, the movement that it wants to do and see how things go. So I'm going to try and pucker. And again, it's not about sounding good. It's about really feeling what your body is telling you to do and what, what signals are being sent. <laughs> Okay, so you can tell there's a little bit of spasm going on there, so I'm definitely having a little bit of of um of resistance against the pucker. So now I'm gonna try this uh the stretch smile as best as I can. So 
So again, we're practicing extremes, and then you can try the collapse if you want to, but the collapse I usually found, I usually found my armature collapsing in my pedal to low register. Um, so again, practice any extremes in opposite muscle uh, muscle groups, and then after doing that, I'm going to go ahead and relax, I'm going to try playing it just normally, without thinking about it. And sometimes you will also feel like um, your muscles, sometimes you'll feel like it'll collapse in the sense, I guess I for, should have mentioned this, um, even though your armature um, doesn't collapse, like the frowning collapse in the uh, higher register, like after the middle, middle register and above, collapses in the lower register. The way it collapses in the high register, I notice, is when the air starts to uh, come into the upper and lower lips, and that's fine. So sometimes you'll find that the, your air will want to go into your cheeks or even your upper and lower lip when you're playing it in your middle to high range. Um, and sometimes I have to let it do that. And so that's what it's doing right now. Let me see if I can get it from this other side. There we go. So now it sounds so much better. By the end there, things were feeling much more normal. Let me go ahead and try one more time. There. Okay. So sometimes, um, if you practice these op opposite muscle groups, and then just try to relax and fill things out, um, you'll find that it creates a lot less tension than what was there. Um, that this tension is kind of uh, has less of a grip over your playing. Okay. Um, so play with the puckered or um, smiled embouchure or collapsed embouchure. Um, you can also practice uh, doing either, and I want to demonstrate all these because I'm pretty exhausted already, but um, rolling the lower lip in or rolling it out. Um, rolling the lower lip in and out. So you can, uh, I found that either practicing by rolling the lip all the way back in or rolling it back out or doing both at the same time. So you can buzz or you can play while rolling the lip out. <laughs> I'm kind of doing this fast. Um, you can't necessarily go about the opposite way, rolling back in, but you can still blow air while rolling back in without making a sound. <laughs> Or you can try just uh, one at a time. So this is my lip rolled in. This actually sounds pretty good. I'm going to try rolling up. 
So not as controllable. So I might find that by uh, changing uh, the way my lip is rolled in or out uh, might help a little bit. And again, I do this to find whatever the leverage is for the day, because believe me, it will change day to day. So let's say my leverage today is rolling my lip in, because for some reason that gave me a lot more control than anything else so far. Um, like the puckered smile didn't help, or the puckered arm didn't help, the smile arm didn't help, um, but the rolling the lip back in did. Um, and the rolling the lip out didn't. Um, if you find that the lip rolling in and out helps you a lot, you might want to try looking into um, B.E. Embouchure um, for French horn. It was originally written by a trumpet player, um, but I know that um, Valerie Wells, if you look her up, her up on Facebook or even online, um, she can help you get, uh, she sells the B.E. Embouchure method book, and she can also, also tell you a lot more about the method. Um, and that also has to deal a lot with rolling the lower lip in and out. And um, I don't know all the details, but I know that some people find it really helps with the embouchure dystonia or um, if they're just having embouchure troubles in general, uh, they might find the BE method really helpful for them. If you find that the your lower lip uh, adjustment helps a lot um, with your playing. So you might want to look into that. Um, then um, another opposite movement, playing with the mouthpiece setting on more upper lip playing with the mouthpiece to be on more lower lip. Um, I have a friend that has embouchure dystonia on French horn, and he told me once that um, he he's made a significant recovery, and he's made it even further than I have, um, but he doesn't really talk about it um, to anyone. Uh, but he did tell me that uh, that one of his key aspects of recovery was moving his plane to his lower lip mainly. So now every time he sets, he sets on his lower lip. Um, I, I practice both to see if, if either one helps sometimes, because sometimes I do feel that when you have Amish dystonia, it will gravitate to one area or the other. And again, you will feel your body tells you everything if you're just aware of what it's telling you. Um, so sometimes you'll feel like it, it really, uh, it is, there's much more control on the lower lip than the upper lip. So let's go ahead and try it. And you don't always have to play a scale or, or something, some, even just playing a note will help. Uh, doing this on. Less on my lower lip, now upper lip. I'm going to try lower lip again. Now upper lip. So definitely much more control on the lower lips. I'm going to move it just a little bit lower. Not, And again, you don't have to switch completely to your lower lip, but this isn't something that you have to do all the time. So let's say you find that uh, rolling your lip out while playing on the lower lip um, on the left side of your face um, helps today. Uh, it doesn't mean that's something you have to stick to forever. That's just your leverage for the day. That's what's going to help you today to be able to battle your symptoms. So much better. Okay. Um, then the next movement is uh, moving the mouthpiece to the right side of the face or moving it to the left side of the face. Um, so for some people, they might feel they have more control on one side of the face or the other. Um, dystonia definitely I've noticed with a lot of players, and this is for almost uh, all dystonia cases, and I won't say all because um, there hasn't been enough research, but I definitely know that there is a correlation to this because I know that with uh, even with generalized dystonias or cervical dystonias, um, I've watched a video where Dr. Ferraris, Ferraris is talking about how there's this lack of uh, symmetry between one side of the body and the other. And I feel like this is the same for embouchure dystonia with the face. So, like, a lot of people who talk to me that have embouchure dystonia, I'll notice in videos or even they'll bring it up when they're talking to me online on Skype. Um, they'll, they'll be like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, this one side of my face is looks different than the other. And you can even see it with my face, too, still. Like, if you see this side, it's much more open than this side. This is my, my left side is the side that's kind of... Um, uh, the muscles aren't as responsive. It's not as 
uh, functional. It's a lot looser. It doesn't, it's kind of like, uh, almost, I don't want to say paralyzed, but it just definitely lacks a lot more sensory than the right side. The right side takes the bulk of the, the plane. And you can tell even as the corner muscles are more, more defined than this side, even when I'm talking. Like, look at this. I have like an arch there where over here, I don't as much. Now, part of it could be because you are predominantly already play on one side of the face than the other, so your muscles are more defined on one side of the face. Usually with ombre it's, 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 it, most people will say like it wasn't this way before. I had much more symmetry to my face before I had ombre chidisomia, and I definitely did. Um, I wish I could show a video or a picture or something. I'll try to find one, um, where you can see the difference, uh, between how it looked then and then now. So you can definitely see the difference in the, in this control on the different sides of the face. Uh, so on this side, you, it takes the bulk of the work. So you'll see it, uh, moving a lot, um, or much more defined. Um, so, uh, moving to the left or right side of the face. You can go ahead and try that. I'm not going to demonstrate it here just because I don't, I'm running out of time. Um, and then, uh, changing the angle of the mouthpiece more downwards or upwards. Um, some days, I, I knew that some days I really had to focus on playing almost down, almost like at a, a very upward angle to get things to work. And then some days it was just like a normal downward angle. Um, when I first started losing my ability to play during onset, one of the first things I noticed is that the angle of my, my mouthpiece started going more and more downwards. I had to anchor more downwards. To, to get it to sound more stable. Now it's the opposite. It's like I don't, the, I can't play on a more downward angle. It definitely has to be a little more upward. If I have to use extreme, it's going to be upwards. <coughs> but it's fine now. It's just a normal angle. Um, and then, um, this one I only suggest, uh, if you have ombre dystonia, if you're injured or anything else, please don't try it. Um, just because any normal player, uh, you wouldn't really want to do this. Um, so tilting the head to the left or the head to the right. So um, we talk a lot about when we're um, uh, in our college studies about how you know you bring you bring the horn to you. You don't bring yourself to the horn. The horn adapts to you. You don't adapt to the horn. But with ombre chidisonia, you kind of have to meet the horn halfway because there is no uh, there is no bringing the horn to you um, <laughs> necessarily. Um, you have to really find ways to adapt. And one of those ways I found is either changing the tilt of your head or the angle of your, of your head to help. Um, and I only suggest this, uh, as not as a normal setting, but if it helps you find leverage for the day, then, you know, you can do that and see if it helps you. Um, but I definitely don't, I try to not bring it up that much because I definitely feel like if you get stuck in a certain position where you're like, I have to play with my head tilted this way or completely tilted this way. I don't know if it's the, the safest way to, to play. Um, but again, um, you know, just do it, whatever you feel helps you best. Okay. Um, making the aperture wider or making the aperture smaller. So the opening, the little tiny opening between your lips. If it's wider, does it help? <laughs> Or smaller? I feel like wider helps me. Um, breathing through the nose or breathing through the mouth corners. Okay, so uh, in the beginning stages, I definitely, like I talk about how even the act of setting the horn up, bringing the horn to your face causes you, your dystonia to kick in. Um, and so when I started playing on my horn again, one of my biggest troubles was the resetting all the time. I hated the feeling of, like, every time I tried to breathe in and breathe out again, I'd get so many spasms. <laughs> Anytime I breathed in through the corners, it didn't help. It made things worse. So I had to start trying to do noise breaths. <laughs> I'd start with the air puff, and then I'd breathe in through my nose when I ran out of air. Sorry. 
So nose breaths might help you um, just to lessen the, the reaction of the, the spasms whenever you blow into your instrument. Uh, that might help or not. Um, this ties into the next thing, using more or less air. Now, I talk a lot about the breath support being important um, and using gentle and loose air when you're playing. Um, but you will find definitely in the beginning stages that that either a the more air you use the worse things get or the less air you use the better things sound the better things feel um so you need to do whatever is best for you so even if there's somebody that says use more air use more 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 air don't listen to them if you feel like um using like x amount of air like you know like a really tiny amount of air to get your note to to feel stable then do that and it will improve over time and you'll be able to add more air to it. Um, don't think that just because you're not able to remember you're not, you're, you have Amish to dystonia. It's a dif dysfunctional embouchure. It's not um, a normal embouchure. You can't, uh, you can't address your playing the same way. You can't approach your playing the same way you would if you're a normal player. You can't use more air to just blow your way through things and fix everything. Um, so when I talk about the importance of air, I'm talking about using the same type of air support, focusing on relaxing here and using gentle air when you can. So again, it's all for me. It's all about releasing the tension in the muscles, in the face, um, in the whole upper body, and adapting by being aware of what my signals are, be, what signals are being sent to my body, by addressing them and adapting to them. And feeling things out, experimenting every day, uh, noticing what changes are happening and adapting to them, finding leverage, and then using that leverage to get through my playing for the day. And then over time, things got better. So uh, these are just little things that can that might be able to help you. Um, now, uh, modifications and sensory tricks. Um, I, I classify this under modifications, even though it's just like something completely different. But uh, playing trumpet. For me, I talk about uh, how I, in my teaching I had to use a lot of trumpet playing because I had a lot of trumpet students. I didn't want to bring my horn with me every day, so I brought a trumpet from school. So playing the trumpet for some reason worked really well for me. So I would interchange every week. So I would play the trumpet for one week and then switch back to the horn and find I'm more able to play the horn. Um, and I had to do this a lot. And so I don't know what it is, but for some reason the trumpet just helped me be able to play my horn so much better. Um, again, I still can do the stretching while the playing. Um, some other things that might help you that are sensory tricks that help other people, they don't necessarily help me, but they might help you. Um, sticking cotton between the teeth or putting guard on the molars, um, on just the molars, um, sometimes will reduce people's symptoms. Mainly for, uh, in the studies where this has been done, it's been for people who have uh, a dystonia that kind of resides in mainly the jaw area, like it's coming from the jaw. They have a lot of jaw problems, um, and that might help or not. Um, even just placing a pencil between the teeth and then removing it and playing it might help too as well. Just trying to test and see what works or doesn't work. Um, and that's usually classified as a jaw dystonia phenotype. Um, always listening to the body, figuring out where tension is through either touching the areas of your body and making note, I really feel like keeping a journal is really helpful. Um, either a video journal of your playing, even if you don't go back and watch it every time you record, um, or a physical journal, like writing it every day. Um, feeling out in your body by hand, uh, trying to feel where the tension is while you're playing, or just being aware of where the tension is. And journaling your symptoms, the changes, the relapses, and the progress. Um, if you're a woodwind player and you have an Amish dystonia, um, I've been told that using a softer read helps a lot, so you might want to try that if you're a woodwind player watching this video. Um, for bus players, using a mouthpiece with comfortable back pressure support. I talk about this a lot. Um, I went back to my primary mouthpiece I used when I first started on horn, which is the Parker's Deep Cuff. But I recently, literally in the last month, I switched to this deep, uh, this heavyweight uh, Dennis Wick mouthpiece. Because um, it's the only other mouthpiece I can play on that feels comfortable. Uh, compared to that one, and um, literally I have not switched from my Parker's Deep Cuff in like nine years, so, um, but uh, 
And then uh, just testing, if, if you feel like a, a more free blowing mouthpiece works for you, then play on that if it provides more stability. But if you feel like more back pressure helps, then um, find a mouthpiece that has more back pressure. And let me know in the comments if it works or send me an email and let me know if it works because I'm curious if, if this type of thing works for others as well. Um, and then uh, observing whether your symptoms are better while playing open, stop muted, straight muted, or in a practice mute. I definitely could not play the mute um, in the beginning at all. It was so terrible. I hated playing it in mutes. It was just too much for my embouchure. I don't know why it just became so much more unstable. The only mute I could play in though, and that I actually played in more than I did while playing open, was the the straight mute or the stop mute. Sorry, stop mute. And for some reason, I feel like the stop mute it it created just enough. A, it created a. It was somehow able to create my sound and stabilize it in a way that was comfortable for me to play. So I could play something. Uh, uh, with really uh, messed up, you know, my embouchure dissonance are sending all these messed up signals. I play stop muted and it would still sound good. So I pra want to practice more. So the stop mute was more of like a tone thing. Like I definitely like the way it sounded better. So I play in the stop mute more often. Um, touching the face uh, or twitch or tremor while playing and see if it reduces the symptoms or not. Um, this is a sensory uh, trick. <coughs> And uh, some people will find if they touch a certain area of when they're tremoring, and it doesn't have to be in the exact area where you're tremoring, it can be in the back of the jaw, it could be up near, uh, farther back near the jaw joint, it could be in the middle of the cheek. Um, just touching around, seeing if by touching your face while you're experiencing a tremor, if it helps or not. And if it does, then this is your sensory trick. Um, and some people, even if they think about touching an area while playing, like not physically touching, but thinking about it, Helps, and this is called a, a jest, and this is usually associated with a more general general dystonia. Like if you have like cervical dystonia or something uh, that isn't really necessarily related to task specific dystonia, uh, but for some people it might help. Uh, does playing on the leg or off the leg help? Uh, I definitely felt like I had to play on the leg for a really long time, really really long time. Uh, I definitely could not handle playing off the leg just because it was like too much looseness and moving the mouthpiece everywhere, and my Face had to adapt to the moving and the adjusting the mouthpiece all the time. I definitely had to play on my leg all the time, and I still kind of do. But I can play off the leg when I need to. But I definitely like the stability of playing on the leg. Uh, does a heavy weighted mouthpiece help or not? Again, tying back into the mouthpiece. You can go ahead and try a heavy weight mouthpiece. This is my first time trying one, and I felt like it really helped. Um, you can also buy separate weights sometimes. Trumpet players have it really good because they they have all kinds of weights that they can purchase. Uh, where horn players, we have like one, and it's like 50 bucks. Um, practice buzzing with the right hand instead of left. I talked about this in the uh, last video. Um, playing with the left hand off of the horn and holding the other area of the horn helps. So if you have a natural horn, this is great. And this might not help you at all, but for some people it does. Um, just playing with your right hand on the horn and just buzzing into the mouthpiece. <laughs> Or something. Um, that might help you as well. And um, just because you're using a completely different, uh, you're using a more a not dominant side of your body, a dominant hand. Um, just playing with or without a mirror help. I definitely would say avoid playing with the mirror. Um, if you were taught anything about embouchure form and function, or you had to use a mirror when you're playing, um, significantly rely on a mirror at any point during your your um, upbringing and teaching in uh, lessons and learning, I'd say don't play at the mirror. Just because it causes us to focus too much on our face and our embouchure and what things are doing, it's okay to videotape yourself and then watch the playing later, <coughs> but we really don't want to get lost in the way things look and we want to really feel things out. So it's much better to play without the mirror. And again, this is just my what helped me and, and I suggest, but if you feel like it will help you, then you can go ahead. Um, but I definitely feel like it was dangerous. And every single time I try to go back to the mirror, even now, when I try to go back to the mirror and look at the way I'm playing, or just even like, even though I'm not fixing anything or trying to adjust anything or address anything, it still affects me. Like every time I look in the mirror, it's just like, oh my gosh, like, uh, it just ruins everything. So I have to not focus on the mirror at all. 
Um, and then uh, when I got to the later playing stages, as I recovered more, um, I found myself, uh, like, especially when I'm working on more melodies and um, etudes or just uh, playing an orchestra or, or playing music in general, um, I switched to more of like an imitation learning, uh, playing with recordings, um, even if I could only play a couple measures along with the recording of a concerto. Um, tone guiding, really focusing on my tone in the later stages. Um, and style guiding, like focusing on the style, uh, try to mimic style rather than focusing on technique, uh, focusing on the tone rather than dynamics or muscle control. Um, and imitation learning through playing along with the recording, listening to recording and playing with my headphones in, not necessarily listening to my sound, but just playing along with the recording with the headphones in, hearing the player rather than myself. Um, and avoiding working on specific techniques instead of pieces, um, or specific, avoiding playing, working on specific techniques and instead focusing on pieces that touch upon techniques, um, but not focus on repetitiveness. Because sometimes we get so lost in technique and we focus on repeating things over and over and over and over again. But if you're able to find more musical pieces where there's like, you know, just a little tiny section that works on, on articulation and then you move on and you play something more melodic or legato if you can. Um, so trying to focus more on musicality when you do regain your abilities and you are able to play again um, with more control and you're at a later stage where you feel like you're almost to a full recovery, um, focusing on more of that. Um, and then again, always keeping up the, the care, the physical care. I still try to avoid not playing with a metronome very often. Um, if I do, it's very small snippets or, or I'll practice rhythm outside of playing. Like I'll practice saying the rhythm with the metronome rather than playing it all the time with the metronome just because, um, I, I still feel like it causes me to tense up a little bit too much. Um, I still, uh, record myself and working on mantras and, uh, performance mentality. Um, and then uh, when I was able to take that leap of playing in a group again and playing in an orchestra again, um, just uh, focusing on the social aspects of it rather than my playing abilities. I enjoy being at this rehearsal. I enjoy socializing with people. I, be, I enjoy being around other people again and just focusing on those positive aspects rather than getting lost in, in you know, am I playing good? Um, oh, my gosh, like, am I going to be able to get through this? It is scary at first, but... Um, Knowing that if you have the prep work done and you recovered so far and you know that um, you can do stretches and certain things that help relieve the tension, you're going to be okay and just kind of take the moment to enjoy enjoy your time being back in, a, in an ensemble. Um, so that's all I have for this video right now. I will go ahead and make more videos over my playing and what has helped me. And again, this um, I kind of think of uh, recovery as, uh, as an onion. It's definitely various layers to it, and there's so many layers. And and again, it's always one of those things where it's two steps forward, one step back. There's always relapses, and um, and your playing will sometimes even change day to day. Sometimes it will stick for like a week or a month. Um, <laughs> so it's important to not give up and just keep trying. Um, and then. I am going to make more videos over uh, certain uh, details, go into more details about uh, what helps me um, and showing some more of my playing. But I just want to take the time to make this video over beginning rehabilitation process and kind of show you what's worked for me. I hope that is clear and that things are understandable. If not, just shoot me a message or a comment um, and let me know if you have any questions or concerns or if you... Um, are interested in learning more about a specific thing I talked about, please let me know. I would love to do a video over it and let you guys know um, more about it. So that's all for now. I hope you guys have a great day and thank you for watching my video.